Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Wednesday, September 26, 2018. My name is Michael Brooks. And I'm Michael th- Wednesday. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown brooklyn usa on today's program murtaza hussein reporter and columnist for the intercept we're talking about the trump administration war on the icc counting the costs the fallout of the syria war and trump at the un and a global update fresh right before the show new horrifying just I don't know the word, grotesque accusations against uh, Judge Kavanaugh and his whole, not his whole, but many parts of his cohort in high school and at Yale. Trump is attacking the accusers and Arizona and Republicans in the Judiciary Committee pick a prosecutor to question Dr. Ford and four people are now corroborating her assault claims. Avenatti says this is the real deal with Julia Swetnick, and she certainly has a very real things to lose if she wasn't being anything other than fully truthful. Bill Cosby is going to jail. His spokesperson has some pretty incredible things to say about him and Judge Kavanaugh. Trump (laughs) threatening to cut off aid to loyal countries. Mike Pence knew in advance about Michael Flynn's phone calls to Kislyak. Fernando Haddad growing in the polls as it looks like Brazil, under the leadership of the Workers' Party, might fight off a fascist challenge. Tom Steyer to spend millions backing Andrew Gillum in Florida and the GOP is zeroing in on abortion to turn out its troops for the midterm elections. All that and more on today's Majority Report. Adam Rainstopper with uh, the uh, the new, we're doing a trial run for new openings. Yeah, we've had a few submitted. Uh, thanks, uh, Adam Rainstopper, Jimmy Reefercake's new collaboration Jimmy partner. Jimmy Reefercake's new collaboration so we're partner. We're coming up real quick with that one. That, I think that w- it's a bit, it's weird because we're so used to the pressure drop. It is. It's very, it's very different. hard to get uh, your sort of like to, to do your shout outs over a new beat. Yeah, like, because... It's not like Pressure Drop is a very um, serious song, but you could do like serious headlines over it and it didn't feel out of place. No, it didn't feel out of place. That felt a little... It's hard to talk about the Kavanaugh stuff. Right. I'm talking about just this horrifying, disgusting stuff, and I feel like I should be like an extra, like, I don't know, like we should be at some some, like ska party in the mid-90s or something. Um but thanks, Adam. That was uh, thank that was you, really Adam. Nice. No, that was good. That's a strong it was contender. Tight. tight, strong contender. We've made the point, and of course, this probably already wouldn't apply because now there's already so many other stories coming out here that if Judge Kavanaugh had said, "Look, there was an incident. Stuff happened when I was younger. I've learned. I've grown. Uh, we wouldn't be talking about this." We would be talking about actually all of the horrifically destructive things that he wants to do to the court. Republicans are still fixated on this high school doesn't matter talking point, which also contradicts. And it's a very interesting defense because it basically takes as a fact, essentially, that the guy they're defending is lying (laughs) completely today. Here's Brian Kilmeade with, uh, you know, he's just outraged the poor guy 
Uh, mm-hmm. So that's what, and I was at, at back to school night last night yeah. for my 10th and 12th grader. And okay. little did I know, I was just trying to see if they have blown any shot in any success in life in 10th and 12th grade. Because that's what I'm getting from this whole process. Well, when in doubt, go back to high school and college, even if you're in your 50s. But there are serious allegations that have been leveled against Mr. Kavanaugh by Dr. Christine Ford. They're that, serious. They are serious. They're serious, but they're unproven. <laughs> and for people to go in life and say, okay, let's go back to high school to stop you from moving forward. I mean, I heard of your transcript match, uh, mattering in ninth grade for college, but I didn't know your ninth and 10th grade actions could really reflect on what happens in the Supreme Court. Well, I welcome Brian Kilmeade to a broader struggle for restorative justice, for a more compassionate society, one that does not try juveniles as adults, ones that act- one society that actually looks at... Um, as many prisoners as possible as people who could be rehabilitated in society uh, and uh, a, a less uh, destructive culture. I, I welcome you to that, Brian, uh, to, to that battle, Brian. I doubt I'll see you there, though. Uh, but they're pushing the high school talking point. This morning, Michael Avenatti, uh, who did tease this, and... Let me just stipulate. The reason I stipulate this, I understand he's done some things with immigration law that are questionable. And I just want to say that because obviously, you know, uh, Stephen Ronald Reagan is a very important person to this show and a friend and a very serious immigration attorney. And it's important to note um, where Avenatti's maybe been remiss. And we also don't support his 2020 presidential. We, we're not <laughs> big fans, but. I think he's. Mo- I think he's certainly mostly been right uh, with his aggressive approach to Michael Cohen and to Trump and to this whole cabal, and um, he's now brought forward uh, a woman named Julia Swetnick, and I'm going to just read uh, a bit actually from her sworn dec- uh, declaration. My name is Julia Swetnick. I'm a resident of Washington, D.C. I fully understand the seriousness of the statements contained within this declaration. I have personal knowledge of and information stated hereon, and if called to testify to the same, I would do so. I would and could do so. I'm a graduate of Gathersburg High School in Gathersburg, Maryland. I presently hold the following active clearances associated with working in the federal government, Federal Trust, U.S. Department of Treasury, U.S. Mint, MSM, Internal uh, Revenue Service. In other words, I have things to lose. I have also held the following inactive clearances, Secret U.S. Department of State, U.S. Department of Justice and Public Trust, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. And she goes on to list a range of... of, uh, government employments and now she's talking about when she first met mark cavanaugh in the early 80s and uh she and uh, also mark judge i would describe them as joined at the hip and i consistently saw them together in many social settings she said point number seven following the first introduction i attended well over 10 parties in washington dc area during the years of 1981 to 1983 where Mark Judge and Brent Kavanaugh were present. These parties were a common occurrence in the area and occurred nearly every weekend during the school year. On numerous occasions at these parties, I witnessed Mark Judge and uh, and Brett Kavanaugh drink excessively and engage in highly inappropriate contact, including being overly aggressive with girls and not taking no for an answer. This conduct, including the fondling and grabbing of girls without their consent, I observed Brett Kavanaugh drink excessively excessively at many of these parties and engage in abusive and physically aggressive behavior towards girls, including pressing girls against them without their consent, grinding against girls, attempting to remove shirts on girls and to expose their private parts. I likewise observed him being verbally abusive towards girls by making crude sexual comments to them that were designed to demean and humiliate them. Yeah, let's skip to 11, though you should read the whole affidavit, but this is where it gets... um, I mean, this is certainly, a, you know, I, th- I don't know what statute of limitations on these things are, uh, but th- these are the most serious charges. During the years 1981 to 1982, I was aware of efforts by Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh and others to spike the punch at house parties. I attended with drugs and or grain alcohol so as to cause girls to lose their inhibitions and their ability to say no This caused me to make an effort to purposely avoid the punch at these parties. I witnessed efforts by Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh and others to target 
particularly uh, girls so that they could take particular girls so they could take advantage of them. It was usually a girl that was especially vulnerable because she was alone at the party or shy. I also witnessed efforts by Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh and others to cause girls to become inebriated and disoriented so they, they could be then be gang, gang raped in a side room or bedroom by a train of quote unquote train of numerous boys. I have a firm recollection of seeing boys lined outside of, of rooms at many of these parties waiting for their quote unquote turn with a girl inside the room. These boys included Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh. So these are coming out. Oh, we sorry. Oh, yeah, you're right. Excuse me. In approximately 1982, I became a victim of one of these gangs, a gang or train rapes where Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh were present. Shortly after the incident, I shared what had transpired with at least two other people. During the incident, I was incapacitated without any consent and unable to fight off the boys raping me. I believe I was drugged using quaaludes or something similar in what I was drinking. I am aware of the other witnesses can, that can attest to the truthfulness of each of these statements above. So they're um, scheduled to hold hearings tomorrow. We're going to start. We're going to start early. streaming a rally around nine fifty. Okay, nine fifty. Uh, we're going to stream them live, and I mean, you know, obviously now we're in a completely like we're not talking about <laughs> the conversation is already on a completely different ground um, than you know this sort of disingenuous nonsense about high school. Um, into allegations that don't get more serious by very credible accusers. And people need to, I mean, take this in and of itself. And then I think also realize that the Republican Party is doubling down entirely so far on defending this. Yeah, don't put anything past them. And I would not put anything past them. And I think actually for some of these people, it's going to become a point of principle in a broader misogyny and broader politics which is horrifying and grotesque and dangerous and you know obviously just a rot at the core um of american life so we will be here with that tomorrow and talk about it more on the second half of the show but for now we're going to take a brief break and we'll be right back with murtaza hussein from the intercept Back to the Majority Report. Joining us now is Murtaza Hussein. He's a columnist and journalist for The Intercept. Murtaza, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, always good to be speaking with you. Let's start with uh, Donald Trump at the United Nations. Actually, man, I should have said before, I don't know if we still have the laughter handy. It's always fun to to play that clip. Um, actually, yeah, let's just let's just play this clip really of, of Trump talking about how great 
uh, the last uh, year has been or his entire administration has been and the response from the General Assembly. And maybe you could sort of just touch on Trump at UN week to get us started. Today, I stand before the United Nations General Assembly to share the extraordinary progress we've made. In less than two years, my administration has accomplished more than almost any administration in the history of our country. America's so true. <laughs> Didn't expect that reaction, but that's okay. <laughs> Murtasa, what's it been like? Uh, what I mean. <laughs> I guess he's trying to be diplomatic there. Well, you know, he's doing the boasting he does in his domestic uh, speeches, except that, you know, the UN audience is not primed for it and they're not the most appropriate audience. They don't care what you claim to have accomplished in the last two years as your administration or whether it's better than uh, Obama or Clinton or Roosevelt or whoever you're trying to compare yourself to. Uh, it's an absurd statement, and it predictably, in my view, got a laugh. I'm glad he was forced to acknowledge it, and I'm glad that people are forced to acknowledge that he's making the administration into a literal laughingstock internationally. Into a literal, I mean, that is really funny to reflect on, like, how many, like, that Republican talking point of, like, and Trump all the time with Obama, they're laughing at us, and it's like, literally, the world just I, laughed at us. <laughs> you know, like the, uh, my capacity for shock has been so degraded over the last few years, or what's really possible. Uh, you know, the Overton window has moved so much, but still, like to be giving UNGA speech, the American president, and literally the entire world is gathering and laughing at you, and laughing to the point where you're forced to acknowledge it. Uh, it's quite the cinematic moment. It's a moment of real national decline uh, punctuated on the world stage. Let's talk about, you have a piece called The U.S. Goes to War Against the ICC to Cover Up Alleged War Crimes in Afghanistan. Uh, I talked about this actually briefly on the Michael Brooks show last week. Do you, first of all, let's do a little bit of a history if you can because the united states this is this is definitely an area obviously that sort of hostility from the united states the international criminal court is not new to trump it has a history here so maybe we could talk about that and then we'll get to uh the question of war crimes in afghanistan you know the united states is one of the few countries in the world which has not signed the rome statute which uh would make it party to the icc and you know there have been Different mess there's been different messaging from different administrations. Uh, Clinton and Obama sort of flirted with the idea of potentially uh, taking some role in the ICC short of being a member. Bush was more overtly hostile. Uh, but fundamentally, the U.S. has never wanted to be party to any international organization which it does not have decisive control over. Mm -hmm. So they want a privileged spot in the organization or they don't want to be part of it. That's generally been the rule. Uh, and the ICC has not really afforded them such a position. And if they were to become party to it, they would legitimate potential investigations into war crimes carried out by American officials uh, in various theaters around the world. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. is, you know, more... How can I put it? They're more likely to be active militarily in different countries around the world than other parties are. Uh, and they do not want the level of oversight or scrutiny that the ICC uh, would put on those activities, uh, and nor do they want, you know, if you take the case of Afghanistan, particularly what they're so exercised about is report, ICC prosecutor's report. Prosecutor's report is into acts of torture and rape and uh, killing that were carried out by U.S. military and CIA in Afghanistan, and it very specifically points out that the responsibility for these acts went very high up the chain of command. Uh, they were not just the rogue acts of some bad apples. And there's absolutely no way that the U.S. would ever allow a situation where their top officials are being indicted by the ICC 
and they're legitimating that process by recognizing the ICC. So, you know, it's the bad, the optics on going to war against the International Criminal Court have never been good, but uh, this administration does not care about optics at all, and they're going full throttle in, attempt, in their hostility and making vows to destroy the organization uh, completely. What are the, uh, well, we'll get to the actions they're taking to undermine the ICC, but first of all, what are these crimes in Afghanistan, and how do they go up the chain of command? So in the, these, this report deals not just with American actions, but also Taliban actions and actions of the Afghan government, and it deals very specifically uh, with years 2003, 2004, the early years of the occupation of the country. Uh, and they deal specifically with detention policy and people who were taken into detention uh, by the Americans and by their contractors, killed, uh, subject to rape, subject to beatings, uh, various other mistreatment. The report does not go into specifics naming names of officers involved or naming victims, uh, but it's a high-level look at the crimes that they've documented, and uh, they documented it being systemic, and they make specific note that uh, these actions came about as a result of policies which are developed uh, by the government. They weren't just contraventions of American policy. They, they were the product of uh, specific policies that U.S. officials had implemented with regard to detainees. And, you know, this is not surprising because the CIA did its own, or sorry, the Senate Intelligence Committee did its own investigation into CIA practices, and it very much found that uh, U.S. officials were responsible for very egregious uh, acts of abuse against detainees. So the ICC report is very general, but the U.S. is trying to withdraw any sort of uh, cooperation with the organization now to make sure that we don't get any of the specifics, because the specifics... Uh, based on what we know so far, would not be pretty. And how does this fit into the broader, like, (laughs) what's incredible, I mean, there's so much happening in the world today, right? Like, obviously, we're focusing on Brett Kavanaugh, and we're, you know, just dealing with all of the, the crises and systems that were already breaking that led us to Trump and global Trumpism. And we're also dealing with the fact that, you know, and maybe you could speak to this briefly, you know, the United States is now engaged in, you know, heavy military activities in at least seven different countries, uh, you know, across Middle East, Africa. uh, And Afghanistan just continues, right? We go from the invasion by the Bush administration, then throwing it on the back burner so we can, so that they could invade Iraq. Then Obama's sort of, We're going to pledge more troops, but also sort of preset a drawdown. Uh, And now, you know, Trump, who occasionally sort of makes some isolationist noises, essentially just sort of doubling up. um, And, you know, it seems to me the only real shift is even a further unshackling and lack of concern for civilian casualties with aerial assaults. And then, of course, the whole, you know, dysfunctional dynamic with Pakistan Indian and Iranian and Chinese sort of poking around and this is all on the back burner but we still have this incredibly important incredibly high human toll global war that doesn't I mean it doesn't I don't even I mean what what is your anticipation about that is this just now what it is we just have this ongoing war and an occupation of Afghanistan I mean what what's the kind of movement I think that uh, we're headed very clearly towards the U.S. order in Afghanistan collapsing. Uh, The Afghan government that propped up after the invasion uh, has not proven it's able to govern. It's uh, been riven with corruption. Uh, It's not been able to exert its authority over vast swaths of the country. And now it's not just Pakistan, but it's China and Russia which are also supporting the Taliban, and Iran as well, who are also supporting the Taliban. Uh, not because they love the Taliban in every case, but because they no one wants to tolerate an American-aligned presence in Central Asia. Hmm. Uh, the government, there's been some recent New York Times reporting that the U.S. has been under-reporting Afghan government casualties 
because it's very clear what's going on here. They're losing so many uh, conscripts to Taliban attacks. They're losing the war. And, you know, Americans don't pay attention to what's going on in Afghanistan very often. But what you see over the last few years is a very clear uh, shift in the balance of power. And you also have Afghan elections coming up soon. And these elections could trigger a new civil war in the country because there are huge regional divisions that are about to be come into very stark relief when this election happens. And it's not at all clear that Afghanistan can stay together as a unified country. Uh, you have a very, very grim situation shaping up. And the only thing that could maybe change it in America's favor is if they sent 100,000 troops back into Afghanistan. That's never going to happen. The, the era of the huge, wide-scale occupation of the country is long past. I don't think it's even good for what I don't see what interest the Americans would have in doing that. Uh, and secondly, it would just forestall the inevitable problems that are coming down the road anyway. How I think it... that you're heading for a Saigon 1975 situation yeah. in the next couple of years. Right. Yeah. How did Iran make a, have a rapprochement with the Taliban? They were fierce enemies. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend sometimes. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. In this case, the bigger threat to Iran is America. The right. Taliban... They had terrible relations with Iran, but they were never going to invade Iran, or, you know, they don't have that ability to threaten Iran, the core interest. And the thing is, the Taliban has become much more pragmatic uh, as an organization over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, so they're willing to make, have relations with Iran, or have relations with China, have relations with Russia, uh, in the purpose of achieving their immediate term goal, which is returning to power in the country and ejecting the Americans uh, or any other uh, Western power, at least in the immediate term. And probably after that happens, they would be open to having some relationship with the Americans based on their own statements in the sense of uh, not creating another pretext for an invasion of the country. What is, um, yeah, I mean, let, let's let's then pivot to another another i mean have afghan part of the reason that's so horrifying with afghanistan on the back burner the sort of afpac story is because we have you know the u.s saudi uae uh just mass murder criminal enterprise inflicted on yemen um happily you know supported by the obama administration accelerated by the trump administration one of the greatest crimes on the planet today um, with, you know, Raytheon weapons killing children. And then we have Syria. I want to talk about the substance of Syria, uh, but I also feel like, you know, just th- I'm not going to get into specific incidents, but this just keeps sort of flaring up uh, on social media and everything else. And to me, I mean, I've said a million times what my basic analysis of Syria is, which seems to piss everybody off. Um, and maybe I'll do it again in a minute. But my kind of question for you is how disturbing is it that some people seem to, they're not even talking about Syria as Syria. Syria is just a proxy for proving some type of bona fides in like social media arguments here, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I really, I hope that this debate is not still going on in the same way. I try to ignore it, Yeah. but I think that, uh, you know, it's important to understand the history of this particular country, which has a very particular history. Uh, it's not just another third world country, you know, as though they're all the same and there's all one paint-by-numbers approach to the whole world that makes sense. Uh, it has a very distinct history with uh, French colonialism and the uh, deliberate uh, fomentation of uh, ethnic and sectarian differences, uh, very brutal military dictatorship, which came about as a result of that. Uh, and then later on, the, inf- the current civil war and the influence of foreign powers from Saudi Arabia and Turkey to Iran and Russia. Uh, you know, it's, I really encourage people to understand the history of the country and then make a judgment. Don't just assume that this falls into some amorphous sort of framework of, uh, from the Cold War, which no longer exists, to be honest. Uh, so, yeah. Where are we in terms of 
the state of play now. It seems to me that the sort of and and my basic perspective, I'll just outline just in you know 20 seconds and you know i think we're generally on the same page but mine has been that this is this is a multi-sector sort of proxy war um you have the russians the iranians propping the assad regime the assad regime has made some very smart political plays and i understand why some syrians relative to what the opposition has turned into would you know feel safer in some respects with assad at the same time it's indisputable and anybody says who says otherwise is I just it's just it's not even I'm sorry it's just not serious uh, is responsible for you know conservatively hundreds of thousands of death torture uh, all sorts of horrific humanitarian crimes and then on the other side uh, you know you have the United States and its Gulf backers um, you know supporting uh, uh, Salafist groups. You had the you reported also on the the Saudi instruction to light Damascus up. Um, so you know U.S. weapons uh, and Gulf money going to really ruthless organizations who I think in some cases have almost like religious genocidal intentions. Uh, and and then of course there was you know the air war on ISIS where we killed a significant amount of civilians as well with maybe degrading ISIS to some extent, but not sort of dealing with the dynamics behind what created ISIS. I mean, I guess before I get to my second question, what I mean, is that sort of, do you buy that that's the kind of general dynamic here? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good articulation. The thing uh, people need to understand is that multiple things can be going on at the same time. Right. Like you can have a revolution, you can have a proxy war, you can have a civil war. They can be more than two parties in a, in a war, and right. there were a whole galaxy of parties, and, uh, factions in the Syrian war, and they continue to be. Uh, so you know that those things are not all mutually exclusionary, and right. uh, there doesn't have to be a zero-sum debate on what's going on. Uh, there are many things going on. Uh, I think that uh, in the early years of the uprising, 2011 onwards, there were a really inspiring generation of people who tried to shift, you know, change extremely brutal systems. Like the fact that they're quote unquote secular, you know, a lot of bad people are secular. Uh, in the United States, there are right. horrible monsters who are secular. That's not right. a get out of jail free card. And in fact, they're not even secular per se. They're just very good at manipulating ethnic divisions uh, in their favor. Right. And those people who challenged that, they were extremely brutally treated. And now even just today, we're getting you know, confirmation of people who disappeared, that they were actually tortured in jail, very progressive and democratic people who were, you know, horribly treated by a terrible government. And then later, Syrian society, you know, when some people say revolution, people, we tend to romanticize the word revolution uh, because we associate it with certain uh, positive historical experiences, and sometimes they are positive. But a lot of times, as Franz Fanon even said, you know, a revolution doesn't come about because people plan to happen. They just can't take it anymore. They can't take the way society is. Society just collapses. Right. Uh, he said, you know, people can no longer breathe, and that's what happens. And people just couldn't breathe anymore. And I think that when I look at it fundamentally, who's responsible for destroying society? It's the people who are in power. They suffocate society and then collapse, and these terrible monsters came out of it, like the solipsists and uh, just criminals and things like that. Uh, and now you have a very... It's society where the social fabric has been torn to shreds and, you know, all that you have between chaos and, uh, you know, the established order is the terrible government that you had at the beginning, which is going to govern even more brutally now uh, because of what's happened in the last six, seven years. Uh, and, yeah, I think that uh, you, there's a few areas outside government control which are not exemplars of uh, democracy. They're just people doing the best they can in a terrible situation. Right. And I think obviously, I mean, I've said a lot, of course, I, I, I think it's important not to romanticize either. But of course, if there's any faction or place that I'm going to have a certain higher degree of sympathy for politically and otherwise, it's obviously the Kurdish controlled areas, um, you know, on a number of levels and not to, you know, they're, they're obviously nobody is perfect. But I think if you're looking for any area of, you know, potential kinship lift, uh, kinship with from a sort of global left internationalist perspective it would be there do you think going back in the timeline um 
in 2013, I think, the former South African president, Thabo Mbeki, gave an interview with uh, Mike Hanna on Al Jazeera. And he said, and it was a sort of the conversation of should justice trump peace? And he was articulating a perspective which, you know, he has, I think, a very valid argument on, but also a problematic policy history, arguably. He probably could have been, you know, certainly stronger with Zimbabwe as an example when he was president of South Africa. But at the same time, he also has a perspective of, and first of which, obviously, the massive double standards of places like the United States who have their own, you know, support for brutal and bloody regimes, plus their own, you know, massive death counts and everything else. Uh, but his point being that when he was transition, when he was negotiating with and part of the sort of key African National Congress teams that ended apartheid, which, of course, you know, in the 1980s, 70s and so on, uh, you know, the apartheid regime, that was one of the worst, you know, most cruel, most murderous, most barbarous regimes in the world. But he made the point that he did not want any of the people that he was negotiating with sort of carted off before an international criminal court, even though they had, you know, literally murdered his colleagues um, and made him a second class citizen. Uh, you know, he needed them to negotiate. Was there a time in Syria where it wasn't, you know, to coddle the Assad regime or in any way to undercut the real organic parts? Because certainly in 2011, the first uprisings, like people say like, oh, that was a CIA, whatever. I mean, I'm so, you know, first of all, it's not, uh, it, 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 this is not documented to say the least. And also it's, you know, incredibly uh, undermining of people's, you know, especially at that point, just think about very basic legitimate complaints about things like food prices um, to say that, you know, people weren't actually angry at what was a very brutal autocratic and actually under the sun Assad and increasingly sort of open to kind of neoliberal regime. Was there a time when a sort of uh, smart diplomacy that didn't go in the direction of if, you know, he has to go, but we're not really going to do anything to have him go. And then what we will do is the CIA and the Gulf will do their usual thing of letting weapons flow around to, you know, Salafists and criminals. Uh, and then, you know, the Iranians and the Russians will engage in their own, you know, proxy imperial uh, schemes. Was there was a diplomacy process ever really possible here? You know, if you study the history of the Syrian Ba'athists, yeah. And uh, the way they've governed and uh, the ideology or the, I say post-ideological character that they've had in the last several decades, I think that there's no way that they ever would have negotiated. Uh, not any way that, in the sense that they would actually give people what they want, which is, you know, sharing power or reducing their power mm -hmm. or even putting a new leader or making a new political dynamic in the country. They're completely, they could have negotiated any time between... The war could have ended any time between now and 2011. The so one thing you could have done is, okay, Assad's going to resign, we're going to have elections. Okay, then the conflict is, you can even maneuver your way into a privileged position in that new political order. But no, it was a very zero-sum attitude from day one. They did things to buy some time or to manipulate public opinion. But I don't think that they ever would have negotiated uh, because, you know, we think a lot of fanaticism as, you know, religious fanaticism. But there's also... The fanaticism of just power, right. the fanaticism of just uh, arrogance and greed and all these things like that as well. And I think that this government, if you study its history, it has perfectly emblematized that. Uh, it's, you know, it's a republic. What kind of republic is passed from father to son? Right. This is a monarchical practice. Right. Uh, and these are people who were, they said very clearly when the slogan was that we govern Assad or we burn the country. And they actually from 2011 onward, they governed in that way. They said, okay, if you don't want Assad, we'll burn down wherever you live. Right. And they did that. So I think that, you know, it's horrible what happened, and that there were things which could have been done differently. And I think that after 2013, you know, it was not in people's interest just to continue the war and feed it to no end. It just destroyed the country. But I don't think that they ever would have if things had been approached differently, they would have negotiated. You know, it's very, it's hard to remember now, but the neighboring countries around Syria had good relations with Syria. Turkey mm -hmm. had very good relations with Syria. The Saudis had good relations with Syria. And when the first uprisings happened, they were defended them. They said, 
uh, you know, let's, he's a reformer, let's give him some time, let's try to talk to them to end the assault on homes that don't send tanks into homes. But they refused, they just did it, because that's how they're used to governing. So, you know, I just think that most likely counterfactuals are hard, but I don't think so. Right. Uh, what happens now, final question, in terms of, you know, you have a new piece on sort of people accounting for the dead, um, which is depressing and horrifying. And then in terms of, you know, you're just seeing a, a double down um, on a sort of, a, you know, a victorious, brutal regime. You know, well, after a war happens, and South Africa is a very good example you brought up, you know, terrible thing, crimes are committed, uh, mistakes are committed. Uh, and then, you know, what's next? How do you move forward? Like human history is built on terrible conflict and the bones of previous people who have been exterminated. The way, only way you can move forward in a constructive way is to account for those crimes and to express contrition or to express some sort of change in the positive direction that lets people heal and move on. Yeah. What the government in Syria is doing is not doing that at all. It's doing, it's behaving, it's saying, okay, you know, your wife or husband disappeared in 2012. They're protesting. You know, you never heard from them again. They would, you know, that they were killed in prison or they're tortured in prison. Here's the, we're not even going to tell you. If you come to the government office and you ask about them, oh, you know, they had a heart attack or they died mm -hmm. of natural causes at 24 in the prison. They are basically telling people, hey, look, you know, you can't do anything about what happened. We won. Your loved one who died, it doesn't matter. There's not going to be any accounting. There's not going to be any apology. There's not going to be any truth and reconciliation process. We're in charge now. Uh, no one's going to help you. And that's how things are going to be. And is that really a recipe for... It's not a recipe for justice, first of all. And I don't think in the long term it's a recipe for stability either. People... I've been to the camps in, in Turkey uh, full of Syrians who have been expelled. These people want to go back home and they're very angry. They had their family members raped or killed. Uh, you're just planting the seeds for a new round of hatred and revenge. Uh, and I feel that a smarter government, a less fanatic government, would not behave in that way. Right. Well, Murtaza Hussein, uh, he is a columnist for The Intercept and uh, a reporter. I always appreciate your work, and thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right, everybody, we're going to go to the fun half. We've got a lot to get to and uh, we will take it from there. Last night on the Michael Brooks Show, I talked to Alberto Almina, who is a Brazilian political uh, scientist and pollster. We talked about the election. He's Brazil Nate Silver. He is the Brazil Nate Silver, although I think uh, with a more Except charming cooler. act. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Very a lot cooler. Brazil, uh, the way I think that is characteristic of the Brazilian way of speaking uh uh, English and it's great. I like it. No, it was great. It was a it was a lot of fun. We crunched the we actually got into some data and some regional dynamics and uh, he's predicting good things in that election, which obviously first and foremost for Brazil, but it does have some implications on halting this global march of fascism um, and and so on. Then Matt Taibbi came in. We had a great time with Matt Taibbi. Taibbi looks like he's becoming a new, he's probably going to be a new uh, regular presence on TMBS this Sunday, an illicit history of the Maple Leaf. What's Canadian politics really about? Uh, and Woke Bros, of course, with Waz, uh, patreon.com slash TMBS. Check out Jamie, Sean, and the Antifada. Uh, really interesting episode on debunking, or not debunking, but guiding the Illuminati story into a story about capital. It's really good sort of... Uh, meeting people where they are. Meeting people where they are. I love that. Matt? Uh, yeah, Literary Hangover. Check out the Scarlet, epi uh, uh, Scarlet Letter episode if you haven't checked out that yet. And uh, I should have the second installment of my reading series available for patrons for the book Hope Leslie by Catherine Maria Sedgwick. Uh, either tonight or tomorrow, I'm hoping. So, Patreon.com slash Literary Hangover. Awesome. All right, I think uh, we will. Uh, I will dispense with the uh, fish and Grateful Dead jokes, Brendan. Uh, I think they were somewhat funny while they lasted, and we're going to need to come up with a new angle for joking about the fact that you don't have a Patreon to vlog yet. I know.
Someone's got to hold it down for the majority report. Um, <laughs> we're getting the war chest ready for Politicon in LA. That's my job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Do All right. We, do we know when we have any announcements regarding that? Or I think that's up to Sam's discretion. Okay, well. Oh, I'm holding everybody in, dis- in suspense. <laughs> do you see? All right, we'll see you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back, back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, 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 I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, what you mind of? I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck em. Fuck em. Uh, <laughs> Almost says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are black, 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 black Africans. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are black, 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 black. Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck Fuck Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black. Black. Come on! <laughs> Black. Come on! Black. Come on! Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here! I, 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 I am a total pussy. Pussy, 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 Welcome back to the Majority Report on the fun half. You are calling from a yeah. Skype number. Are you there? Hello. It's like we're hearing someone's flat right now. <laughs> Hello. Are you there? All right. That was interesting. That was interesting. Um, let's see. You're calling from a 314 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Michael, what's up? This is Chris from Taiwan. Hey, Chris, what's going on, man? Well, I'm not in Taiwan right now. I'm in the suburbs of Minneapolis. Well, welcome back to the States, man. It's weird, man. It's really weird. I would imagine. How long were you in Taiwan for? Three years. Oh. I intend to go back once the election's over, but... Well, well, they say Taiwan uh, is the Minnesota of Southeast Asia, don't they? (laughs) Yeah, I hear that all the time. Yeah. But yeah, um, I'm working on my friend's campaign for the Minnesota State House, and uh, right. the majority report actually ends at around the same time I start door knocking every day. So 
It's perfect timing. That is perfect timing. Um, I want to say something to the audience. Yes. Actually. So I've been spending all day, every day, walking around the suburbs of Minneapolis and talking to complete strangers about politics. And just anecdotally speaking, um, I just want everyone to know that there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm among the Democrat voters, and there's like a big feeling of being disinterested and demoralized among Republicans. So That's interesting. And Why? Yeah, and among... Uh, well, they, well, okay. So I think that they know that they're going to lose, first of all. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also think they're not super psyched about a lot of these guys. A lot of these people are super interested in Trump and, Mm -hmm. and behind Trump, but don't necessarily have the same enthusiasm for people lower on the ticket. So, so they don't blame uh, Trump for why things are getting bad i'm telling you man this is a cult yeah that's exactly that's exactly what it is and the cult leader is not on the ballot so we've got that going for us (laughs) and among uh independents and persuadable voters there seems to be a lot of uh anger towards washington and towards the gop in particular Mm -hmm. um so what are they what are they mostly angry about Well, to be honest, I think they're mostly angry about superficial things. Mm -hmm. I think they're grossed out by the tweeting and by the dysfunction and the lack of decorum and things like that. Um, Right. But uh, some people are pissed off about policy, too. Um, I hear people mention the kidnapping children and putting them in cages that comes up from time to time that's actually that's Um, good to hear so that just how this the sort of the utter moral bankruptcy of that registered what does it look like yeah i mean what does it look like eric paulson in the third district of minnesota (laughs) matt's trying to bag Uh, that whale i I actually just saw a poll the other day showing dean phillips ahead yeah i saw that too. Um, nice Nice. Yeah. Take it, Paulson. And actually, anyone, I don't know if you guys covered the Bigfoot ad, but if not, you should. Oh, yeah. We, um, we, anyway, we watched it. anyone who's listening to Google uh, Dean Phillips' Bigfoot ad, it's hilarious. All um, right, man. But I say, oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I, I want to say one more thing. Um, so I, if there's anyone out there who's, like, listening and wondering what they ought to be doing between now and Election Day, I just want to strongly encourage everyone to – find a campaign or a public interest group they believe in and try door knocking. Um, yep. I think you'd, you'd be really surprised how many people are willing to talk to a stranger about politics and open up about their concerns. And I think you'd be surprised uh, how many people are persuadable and how many people are willing to listen. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've learned, I've learned this lesson before, but going door to door and talking directly to voters works. It makes a difference. Like, do you remember that photo that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez posted um, after her election of her worn-down shoes full of holes? Yep. You know, that's how she won the campaign, and that's how we can keep winning going forward. So that's all I wanted to say to That's actually, yeah, that's perfect. I 100% agree with you. Total cosign. Thanks for the call, man. You are calling from a 502 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? My name's Connor. I'm calling from Louisville, Kentucky. I actually got a hold of somebody. Hey, Connor. How you doing, man? Welcome to the show. Good. Who, who, who is this I'm speaking with? This is Michael Brooks. Michael Brooks. Well, I would tell you, Michael, that I have lost my faith over the years in a lot of young people. But in the past, uh, you all have a Mr. Ford, and I'm sure you have jumped through some psychological hoops to get the position in the chair that you are, and I respect Mr. Cedar's hiring uh, practices. And I am calling, actually, oh, and to refer back to the people that walked out on Pence uh, at Notre Dame, uh, this was very enlightening. And, and I, so I'm seeing young people coming up and, and being much more informed. And mm-hmm. over the past, that's been very discouraging. So uh, kudos to you all and to let you... Um, uh, I was wanting to talk to you about another caller had called in about the Constitution, and he started carrying on about Howard Zinn, and I'm not going to go in, bless Howard Zinn, may he rest in heaven and all that. Uh, if Howard Zinn didn't make it to heaven, none of us are going to make it. Uh, I'm a big 
Edward R. Murrell, Howard Sam, Noam Komsky, Amy Goodman, Tim Hartman, Keith Overman, the Young Turks. With, uh, okay, are you, you all? Thanks, man. What Jackman, what Jackman, is the I, question? I, I believe you all friend. are literally. Excuse me. I believe you all are literally the light at the end of the tunnel. So we agree. In that, I would like to say one of your young men was. Um, it might have been you. Uh, you had a caller that was calling in and, and carrying on and trying to talk over you, kind of like what I'm doing now. I would say he was saying he was listening to some local radio show, but I would say that his preferred choice of listening was to Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, and this is their M.O. to talk over people, and this is where they get that, and they can't help it. It is like I, I agree. I, hey, man, I appreciate the call, and we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Thank you so much for it. Um, you're calling from an 847 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, Michael. It's Josh. Josh from Chicago. How are you, man? Good to hear from you. I'm good, man. I'm good to hear. Good to speak to you, brother. Good to speak to you. Um, so actually, I was going to call him with, well, I was going to call him defend Beta O'Rourke, but uh, after him defending Ted Cruz, uh, I think I'll give that a thought, pass thought, today. Thought uh, better of it, huh? Thought better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Beto. Um, did you see Fahrenheit 11.9? I'm sorry, Josh. Can I just do something really self-indulgent? I apologize. I, I'm just. I want you to ask your question, but I was. This is a good zing of me on Twitter, so I do want to shout it out. King of all I amers tweets at me and says at underscore Michael Brooks wants to hang up, but also appreciates the praise. Dot dot dot. Add click. <laughs> the real life that is a retweet. good. That's a that's a legit. <laughs> it's like really. It's like reeling in a fish. You give it some slack and then you tug and then you give it some slack and then you reel. Wants reo. to hang up, but appreciates the praise. Oh my god, my narcissism I'll, I'll hang that up fucking too, obvious. Okay, all right, me. that was funny. Okay, I, I have not seen the new Michael Moore movie. Have you? I have, I have. Um, so I think one of the things he talks about in there, and one of the things that as deeply depressing as parts of that movie is, and especially when he talks about Flint, Michigan, and just how much of an ethnic like cleansing that actually was. Mm -hmm. Um. The thing that is hopeful, and I, I know there have been like callers uh, earlier in the week who have called in asking, you know, what's wrong with Democrats, you know, as they currently are? Why are you have AOC and, you know, all these other insurgent people coming in and taking over? And I think the thing that made me really hopeful is when he talks about people like AOC mm -hmm. and then uh, the woman from Michigan, who uh, Rashida Tlaib, I think is her name. She's great. Yep. Uh, Rashida Tlaib. Yep. She's great. And even that guy from West Virginia, um, who I don't agree with on everything, but at least, you know, supported the teachers uh, in, the, in their strike. And I think the thing is, he points this out, and I think this is why Democrats need to keep doing this, and this is why AOC is important. Yep. A majority of Americans actually agree with, like, if not socialist policies, at least social democratic policies. Yep. They just don't like the term socialism. But I think... You know, he points out majority of Americans believe in Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. Majority of Americans believe in um, universal free college tuition for public schools. A majority of um, Americans believe in strengthening unions, for example. Um, and I think it's important for Democrats to actually run on something that is popular with most Americans. And these ideas, these policies are popular with most Americans. And I, and I think... If you look at somewhere like Michigan, even though um, he didn't win, even though um, Abdul didn't win, if you add up the votes that he and Shri got, I think it e either equals or is more than what uh, Gretchen Whitmar got, which shows it, that it, those it, policies, it's like those policies are popular, and people thought they were voting for someone progressive, even though they were voting for a charlatan like Shri. Right, and also, yeah, and also I would say even even Gretchen Whitmar, and I would say, or Whitmar, excuse me, it's still really important to vote for her for governor of Michigan. That's a big yes, race. You need it. You to get to. the Republicans out of there. And she also is an indication of, like, 
she's the type of candidate that in a different environment, a much worse environment politically with let with, you know, a non AOC Rashida Tlaib environment, you would look at her in a Democratic primary and you say, well, you know, she's not exciting. She doesn't you know, she's not as to the left as you might as you want and as was fundamentally needed, but she's actually pretty decent. Like she has a pretty good record. She I mean, she certainly was the second choice yeah. after um, Abdul. And so, you know, even in that context, things are moving a bit. And uh, yeah, I think anybody who says otherwise, I just don't, it's just not, it, in the best case scenario, they're trying to level a more fundamental critique, in which case they shouldn't be really worrying about electoral politics. They should be worrying about leveraging social movements. But even then, you're still going to come up against political and bureaucratic power. It can't be avoided. Thanks for the call, Josh. Appreciate it. You're calling from a 919 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm Alden Davis. I'm calling from North Carolina. Hey, what's going on? Hi, I was just, uh, I wanted to ask you, why are the Republicans leaving an FBI investigation on the table for Democrats to later engage in uh, with respect to Kavanaugh? It seems like a really easy way for Democrats to later impeach the man. So... What's their thinking? Because I get Trump's an idiot, but the Republican legislators, by and large, I expect them to at least have some like basic competence when it comes to their own corruption. I don't. I mean, leaving on the table. I mean, I honestly, I haven't considered that or thought about that. My gut instinct is they are they make a lot of political assumptions and calculations with the fact that democrats will never do anything like that and they won't seriously go for the jugular and they wouldn't have an i mean uh, why isn't it it they don't have the numbers to do it but why isn't every democrat calling for the removal of clarence thomas from the court and not for you know even what happened with him and anita hill but literally because of his wife her political connections and her uh, various involvements pose you know, obvious conflicts of interest with Clarence Thomas. And very few people have talked about that. So I think that there is, you know, they're, they're going for, they're going to punt it and they're going to confirm him. And it seems to me that they're actually really doubling down. And I think it shows something about the broader rot of obviously the misogyny uh, and the male privilege, but also really American aristocracy and the idea that, like, none of us should be held accountable. Thanks for the call, man. In fact, let me just get to this. It's being reported in the New York Times just now that Judge Brett Kavanaugh, this is from a report from Nicholas Fantos, Judge Brett Kavanaugh will tell the Senate Judiciary Committee on Thursday that though sometimes he drank too much and was not, quote unquote, perfect in high school. He adamantly denies allegations that he sexually assaulted a fellow student at a party in the 1980s. I drank beer with my friends on weekends. Sometimes I had too many. In retrospect, I said and did things in high school that make me cringe now. President Trump's Supreme Court nominee will tell the committee, according to prepared remarks released by the committee on Wednesday, that it's not why we are here today. What I've been accused of is far more serious than juvenile misbehavior. I never did anything remotely resembling what the woman Christine Blasey Ford describes. See, what is also so weird about this, or not weird, but but troubling and and undermining, is, again, transparency at the outset. They clearly knew this was coming, which is why they had the 60 women and why all of these other things about coaching the basketball team and all of that stuff. They were preparing. I think that's very obvious. And we've already gone through that he actually did this, owned it, and moved. What if he said, you know, I want to be really clear that I lived a life and, you know, whatever, said some things I shouldn't have done, uh, did, said some things I shouldn't have said, did some things I shouldn't have done. Grew up in a toxic culture. Grew up in a toxic culture. I've learned. I've grown. Blah, blah, blah. Now there's a specific thing that's coming. It ain't true. That's already a di So what you have here is you have a guy who for the past couple of weeks, the spin has been. I couldn't have done anything because I was a virgin who played basketball and studied. And I didn't put it on my calendar. And I didn't put it on my calendar. And now all of a sudden we're in, you know, the thing that would have been a reasonable thing to say 10 days ago. 
right? Like that's the dissembling. And I have to say like, like, you know, his response and how utterly creepy he was on that Fox news interview, like not, what was he thinking not going on there. I have no idea, but terrible strategy, not th- like not no rage. <laughs> this is wrong. No. And no, like, I mean, which he already put himself in a box in with like either this happened, horrifying, grew, I get it. Or look, there's a lot of terrible things going on and I see it now and it's clear uh, this isn't true. Uh, So to come with this spin now, especially now that we've, you know, obviously completely left the building in terms of like, it was one incident. It was, you know, this and that. Like now we're getting into, okay, this woman from that Michael Avenatti has brought forward is accusing him of basically some of the most serious crimes that a human being can be conf- accused of and having done so in a consistent regular basis. Perhaps, and meanwhile, uh, which one is this one? And this is, of course, and I and I think this is actually the message from on high. And I think there is structural reasons for this, as I said, in terms of protecting one of their own, whether that be men, whether that be aristocracy, whether that even just be registering the broader point of F you um, for this structurally misogynist party. This is Donald Trump. He's saying Republicans have been too easy on Dr. Ford. What is your reaction to the woman? Uh, what is your thoughts on the woman questioning Kavanaugh's accuser tomorrow? Well, I think the Senate, the Republicans, could not be nicer in the way they're handling this. They could have pushed it through two and a half weeks ago, and you wouldn't be talking about it right now, which is frankly what I would have preferred. But they didn't do that. The Republicans could not be nicer, could not be more respectful to the process, certainly could not be more respectful to the woman, and I'm okay with that. I think I might have pushed it forward a lot faster. I know, I know this particular man, Judge Kavanaugh. He's outstanding. You don't find people like this. He's outstanding. He's a he's a gem. He's an absolute gem, and he's been treated very unfairly by the Democrats who are playing a con game. They know what they're doing. It's a con. They go into a back room and they talk with each other, and they laugh at what they're getting away with. It's a con game, and that's what they play. And that's about the only thing they do well. Thank you very much. This is the absolute last character witness anybody wants on the face of the earth. Donald Trump attesting that not only do you have integrity, but you weren't involved in sexual violence. He's uh, a gem, like, okay? It's like John Gotti being like, this guy is definitely not a member of the mafia. I have never met anybody who's less involved in the rackets than him. Um, although I guess, yeah, Chuck Schumer's just like, did you read the Julia Swetnick statement? And we left, and we left, and we left anything i wish they had that confidence yeah i wish they did if anything i think actually the first m- sort of mini controversy of this is why was diane feinstein not out with this what brett kavanaugh should probably say and probably wants to say is what bill cosby's publicist said yesterday bill cosby was sentenced between three and ten years in prison for his uh drugging and rape of um andrea constand i believe her name is 2004 and of course there's been an unending amount of stories of bill cosby's sexual violence um that and 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 rape and drugging that have come out but bill cosby's publicist is going to connect this to andrew wyatt it's going to connect what happened with bill cosby to brett kavanaugh in a way that uh i don't know let's just watch this i believe and think it's important to point out that that this has been the most racist and sexist trial in the history of the United States. 
Dr. Cosby has been one of the greatest civil rights leaders in the United States for over the last 50 years. He has also been one of the greatest educators of men and boys over the last 50 years. This was not pointed out to the jury or allowed in court because the racist and sexist mass media was attacking and denouncing Dr. Cosby whenever his lawyers even hinted there was racist and sexism present. All three of the psychologists who testified against Dr. Cosby were white women who make money off of accusing black men of being sexual predators. It is no accident that the prosecutor still worked so close with anti-black and anti-male activist groups who tried to extort $100 million from Dr. Cosby in 2014 and continues to produce racist and sexual, sexist publicity against him through the 35 clients. What is going on in Washington today with Judge Kavanaugh is part of that sex war that Judge O'Neill, along with his wife, are a part of. Regarding the psychologist Kristen Dudley, she is a practitioner of mindfulness. This is an Eastern-inspired practice that is controversial <laughs> in the field of psychology. No, I have noticed that a number of accusers also produced it, and I believe that AC and Judge O'Neill conspired with this. Dr. Ford practices mindfulness, a controversial Eastern technique that is under question in the psychological field. <laughs> Besides the fact that black people are violent, this Mooley is totally right. As evidence, it's totally unfair to judge Kavanaugh, who does not practice mindfulness. I stopped it before he could say, as evidence that mindfulness is about racism, Sam Harris. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good point. I appreciate you making me not the only one who has such contempt for Sam Harris that you could just bring him in. Um, yeah, I mean, oh my God. I mean, you know, obviously that statement is so silly and outlandish, but it's like. <laughs> it's it's hard to start that with this is one of the most racist trials in the history of the United well, States. Well, I think it's, there. It's, I mean, it's sort of infuriating, right? Because it's like there's so much to pick apart in like the area, like, you know, like, yeah, like, I guess, I don't know, as much as the Emmett Till one. Hmm. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's like it, it's such an abuse of like things that actually are going to need to be like assessed and figured out. This guy is just like peddling on behalf of a rich celebrity, like uber predator. It's uh, opportunism by reactionaries in a culture that's sort of progressing. So you you grasp onto whatever you can just because it's sort of the tactically useful thing. And you see what sort of effect it has when it's used against people of your own side. And, and you're like, I want some of that. Yeah, exactly. Kavanaugh's like, let's, have, let's set up a meeting with that guy and don't throw the white power signs when he's around. We have work to do. Fundamentally, this is about sex. This is about racism and a war on sex. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, all right, let's try you again from Skype. Are you there this time? Mm -hmm. Hello? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> You're calling from an 818 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, Michael. This is Steve over in Washington. How hey, are you guys Steve. doing? Pretty good. How are you doing? So, I'm good. I wanted to call last night, but I was at work while you were doing your show, so I, I, I'll call today. But um, I, my point is, I, I hope it's pretty clear, but for people who are looking for ways to be engaged and to find ways like they can be making a difference um, and then want to do it outside of uh, political activism or electoral activism. Uh, I think a really good way to do it is just to do it through the workplace. So like you guys talk about mm -hmm. global capital a lot and how everything is connected to global capital. And if you want to make a difference in politics, I just honestly think the best way to do it is through your workplace first. So organizing and helping your coworkers organize and supporting cooperative workplaces if you have a small business or if you work for a small business supporting cooperatively owned workplaces, uh, if you work for a larger workplace doing labor organizing, even if you work for the public sector like a school or, or I don't know, fire department or hospitals, like organizing for the workplace and making a difference there. Um, like I looked at a lot of the marches and their intentions were good, but even things like 
I don't know, I might be off, but even things like the Women's March didn't do that much to make actual change. And so I think a lot of people felt kind of helpless after that. Mm -hmm. And so maybe just starting in the workplace, like, and uh, trying to make change there will will eventually make a difference in the political what is, landscape what as does well. That look I don't know, like? what do you guys think about it? I mean, I don't know what, I mean, you're talking about organizing unions in a workplace? Like, what do you talk, what do you, what do you mean specifically? Well, okay, so, like, I work in a school district, and mm. there's a lot of um, labor issues and pay issues going on. And if you're feeling like your political activism is not doing anything, be a part of the work that the union at the school district is doing. Or if you, you know, like, look at the workers at McDonald's mm-hmm. and those people that are striking. Mm-hmm. I think we lost him. He's still there, though. Steve? Hello? Steve? All right. I guess call back. He Sorry about muted that. himself or something. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, that was not the only... Uh, uh, Donald Trump also had... Uh, some other things to say about foreign policy at the United Nations. This, to me, is the first sign that maybe Trump is really preparing for some type of uh, result that he doesn't want in uh, the midterms. Uh, And who's he going to blame? Well, I would have thought crooked Hillary or the deep state, and I'm sure they will be blamed as well. But this is the ultimate i know you are i know i uh, what is it i know you are but what am i or i know i know i am but what are you i know i metal i know russia meddled in the election but what about china for you yeah exactly here it is this is this is the plan if the republicans get wiped out in the midterms in my remarks yesterday to the united nations general assembly I laid out my administration's commitment to building a more just and peaceful future. Regrettably, we found that China (laughs) has been attempting to interfere in our upcoming 2018 election. Election. Coming up in November. (laughs) Against my administration. They do not want me or us to win because I am the first president ever to challenge China on trade. And we are winning on trade. We are winning at every level. (laughs) We don't want them to meddle or interfere in our upcoming election. Now, I have no doubt that there already is meddling of every kind from any country that has any capacity to do this. It would be an oversight. uh, Yeah, it would be an oversight. Obviously, the United States has a very aggressive history of every kind of meddling. China does it uh, pretty much out in the open, the Saudis, the Gulf states, Israel, um, through lobbying and all sorts of influence peddling. Uh, But it's just funny to me. I don't know whether China is calculating that. A part of me would think that China loves Trump because he's hastening U.S. decline and the sort of passing the baton of a new global system with a much more prominent place for China. Or... There's a Chinese calculus that we want this done in an orderly and smart way and we feel uncomfortable with some unstable idiot who tells us he's going to bomb Syria over over a chocolate cake at Mar-a-Lago. So that remains to be seen. But this is the obvious. I mean, I'm surprised that this type of talking point wasn't deployed faster with regards to counteracting the Russian narrative by Trump and the Republicans. And I look forward to hearing a lot of this. I guess take me down. I need to call back into the system. We got disconnected for some reason. Well, it well, goes back to what we were talking yeah. about with opportunistic use of certain kinds of accusations, right? Like they like what the accusations do. They don't necessarily care about the underlying social justice issue, but they see the political use it has. So they're like, yes, I'm going to do that. Lots of uses. You're the puppet. You're the puppet. You're the puppet. You're the puppet. puppet. <laughs> she made you his puppet, and it was very sad. Resistance she. Resistance. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag resistance. I know. Um, dangerous water there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for trying to trick me to do that impression, Brendan. Um, 
No chicken. Michael, I was an hour late to office this morning after hitting a tree with my car. Please send good vibes. And if anyone on 495 finds my stealing wheel, I'd appreciate getting it back. <laughs> <laughs> Little TMBS reference there. Uh, Kentucky Fried Comrade, potential Brendan Patreon. Brendan's creating a tell-all book on Majority Report. Working title, Sam's Discretion. Uh, James O'Keefe's already paying me pretty well, so <laughs> I'll stay off that. Bates freshman saw Beto saying uh, Cruz should have been chased out of a re- shouldn't have been chased out of a ch- shouldn't have been chased out of a restaurant. I'm sick of the civility bullshit. Knowing Kavanaugh gets through, Franken should have stayed in. Uh, I yeah, I agree. Um, but not be- but no be- for for political response and severity reasons. Like he was totally different in his response. There's a different political calculation. And also, I mean, like, look, I said, like, John Conyers was actually in many ways a very good congressman. Had to go. Yeah, just there was I, no, there's no, mar- I mean, again, because we have to make distinctions and all of these unacceptable things, but there's no margin in that. Yeah, I think Franken, it maybe would have been nice if the investigation went through, but I just think publicly it was becoming untenable. And like, But I they think- chose to make it, like, that wasn't the right play politically. No, it perhaps might, yeah. not. I mean, yeah. although, although I will say, like, we've talked about wanting Franken on the Judiciary Committee, but it would make this part a bit more awkward. You know, that's true. That uh, Bill, Ted Kennedy, one of the reasons that Clarence sailed through, Clarence Thomas and Joe Biden was not nearly as effective as Ted Kennedy, was that Ke- Ted Kennedy was completely hamstrung from going through that because of, you know, Chappaqua, basically, and other stuff. Um, Yemen genocide. Michael, could you run down your issues with Gillum of Florida? I mean, I don't really, I strongly support Andrew Gillum. I'm just saying, and I don't even know to the extent how important this is. I don't know that Andrew Gillum, I wouldn't put him in the AOC Bernie Sanders category. And I think it's in terms of like a guy who's been a social Democrat for his career. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, there's validity in sort of mapping where people are politically, but He's absolutely who I would have voted for in the primary. Uh, he's absolutely moving in the right direction. Uh, he's a great candidate. And, uh, you know, again, something, unfortunately, that's been undermined by the sort of dumb, dumb stuff is you can map somebody's ideology and where they're coming from. That has utility. I'm not doing it to say, like, you know, because he's a fucking sellout. He's a fucking corporate, fucking corporate. Uh, but I don't have issues like that per se. Yeah, he's probably, I guess, maybe I'm wrong, but slightly to the right of, say, a Ben Jealous. Yeah, I, I, I mean, still no, like I, good, I think policy wise, he's right there. As I far just, as governors I, go, he's good. Yeah, he'd be a great governor. I get, I get that, you know. I and I don't honestly, I don't know that much about his record, and you know, and also, guys, like, look, I took Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton in 2016 very damn seriously, but like. Making the wrong endorsement in that case, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Like I, there's there, are literally tens of thousands of bigger things to worry about. Angel regarding Trump being laughed at by the UN, I've seen it spun that someone in the audience yelled "so true" after <laughs> Trump said he accomplished more than anyone, and that's what Trump wasn't expecting. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Uh, Max in Oakland, just a reminder, everybody thinks we shouldn't judge Kavanaugh by actions he took when he was 17. We also believes that it was national security matter that Obama studied at a madrasa when he was nine. Right. No kidding. You're calling from a 917 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hello. Hi, my name is Cielo. Hi. Hello. You're on. Hi, my name is, hi, my name is Cielo. I'm calling from Los Angeles. Hey, Cielo, what's on your mind? Um, I was calling because, um, well, first of all, I'm a woman, and I'm a Native American woman, Mm -hmm. and um, I wanted to talk about uh, Michael Avenatti, and I wanted to get you guys' perspective on why are we so afraid to to have him going for the fight, even if it's only for one term. We need someone really strong, and obviously he's not afraid to go up against Trump, so that's, um, that's my question. You mean running for president? Yeah, yeah, running for president. Exactly. I mean, I just I just think it's, to me, I don't think the calculus... I mean, I'm not, like, freaked out by Avenatti running for president. I just don't think it has legs, mm-hmm. to be honest. And I don't... It seems and like I, he should focus mm-hmm. on what his actual lane is. Yeah, 
I think he's doing a lot of good in his lane. Uh, I, I didn't like the way he related to the immigration issue, and I and 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 sure. that was a that to me is a very big problem that cannot be messed with. It mm-hmm. seems as far as media hits and going up against Trump and doing all this stuff, it's great. But also at the same time, like, and I'm not a big resume, you know, credentialist person, but I also would say like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know, an attorney whose background in politics, I think he did some work at a political firm connected to Rahm Emanuel. I mean, I don't know. Like, I, uh, it doesn't excite me. I, and I also think, honestly, there are a lot of ways in which Donald Trump truly is a, f- a phenom. And I don't know you can replicate him by any anybody, including even on the Republican side. Like, I think some people have really gotten kind of like, you know. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You want me to let you go? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Oh, I didn't. Oh, okay. That's the baby. Oh, cool. Okay, cool, <laughs> all cool, right, cool. Keep talking. Anyways, no, that's all I got. That's all I got. I mean, look, I think if I'm, I'm all for him staying out there and taking pull-ups uh, and, you know, grinding at these guys. I think it's great. I really, I, I want him to, you know, like I keep mentioning the immigration stuff. I have an ax to grind about that. But overall, I think it's great. Mm-hmm. Cool. The only thing cool. I would add I is mean, I think he's a little bit too focused yeah. on Trump and not enough right. on the GOP. And right. that's that's what my main ideological problem with him. Right. But I think if he has the right support behind him, you know, just like anybody who doesn't have any presidential experience, then, you know, they can lead him in the right direction. I just don't see anybody else right now that's as aggressive and, you know, that's like can really just like pound it in and get it done. So, I mean, maybe during a different term, I say, you know, no, forget about an Avenatti. But I don't know. This is like we're in an emergency crisis status right now. So, I mean, I don't know. I, hear I, think, he has the platform I feel to like, do that. you know, on the I feel like on the left, we're so we're so scared, right? We want to be the gentle ones and tiptoe, but it's not time for that. It's time to to pull off the gloves. So, I agree with all. that. I just wanted to get you guys his perspective on that. Thank I you for taking the call, Michael. I, thank you. I 100% agree about taking off the gloves. What were you going to say, Brendan? I think just that he has, in a Trump presidency, he has that platform to do that, going to the media and everything. And I think a lot of the people who are going to be running in 2020 are coming from a Senate where they are not in the legislative power right now. And, you know, we'll see what happens after this midterm and what other people are pushing forward. I mean, I think Elizabeth Warren's ACA is pretty interesting. I mean... Cory Booker's going out there during the Senate Judiciary hearing and trying to get thrown out of Congress. It of the seems Senate, to me so. that they're all getting a little bit of the message that they got to get, you know, a little bit more down and dirty. I mean, I think I don't. Yeah, I don't have a problem with Avenatti. I just don't. I just don't think it works. I don't think there's like a linear corollary to Trump. Right. I think as a broad proposition, do Democrats need to be way more ruthless and hit way harder? And not just, of course, on Trump, but on the whole Republican apparatus, of course, without a doubt. So I totally agree with the spirit of the call. I just don't know if, you know, I don't know. I don't know if he, I just don't, I'm just skeptical that he needs to do it from the uh, position of a presidential campaign. Yeah, I mean, I feel like he's doing it now. He's playing his role well now. Um, Vispa. Did you see Tulsi Gabbard's Are You Fucking Kidding Me face when Jimmy Dore asked her about leaving the Dems to start her own party that would surely pull a 10% immediately out of the gate? When will Dore finally be canceled? Well, look, I'm not I'm not trying to get anybody fucking, you know, whatever. Watch Jimmy Dore if you want. You should just... It's my principle always. Just know what you're watching and reading, right? And like, always, that's the job. Know what it is. And look for better sources always. And look for better sources Engage in, engage in smarter choices in the marketplace of ideas. I didn't watch the interview with Tulsi Gabbard. And again, I'm not, you know, I don't know, man. I just, I didn't watch it. Uh, I had heard of it. I had heard about that. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, again, I think just he, it's locked into uh, the story arc of all that content doesn't work without things working a very specific way. And, I'll also keep saying, look, I understand some of the appeal of Tulsi Gabbard. It's obvious. But if you're going to not be concerned about, you know, Syrian refugee votes, connections to Hindu far right, 
I'm sorry. I mean, that's just that's garbage <laughs> to not have that in a serious analysis of a candidate. Attorney Andrew, thoughts on immediately calling for Kavanaugh's impeachment from the D.C. Court of Appeals if nomination for the Supreme Court is withdrawn or rejected? Keep his name in the news and keep Republicans defending him. Show the kind of justice they stand for. I would 100 percent support that. I think that would be a very smart as well as correct move. He's a uh, regular perjurer. Or, yeah. Or per, I don't know. What's it? What, perjurer? Perjurer. I would absolutely uh, th- think that's a smart thing to do. Jay Cool. Hey, Michael, why do you think some of the dumb, dumb left are so into the war in Syria while Yemen is really talked about? Well, I think that there's less brand differenti- differentiation on Yemen. Like, we all understand that the United States, the United Kingdom, the Western security apparatus and our allies in the Gulf are committing sustained, relentless murder and war crimes in Yemen. Ken Klippenstein, who's a very good journalist, says that actually the right type of grassroots pressure might make Congress act on Yemen. Yemen actually should be at the forefront in terms of influencing policy. Another funny thing is far more U.S. sort of engagement right now in Yemen than Syria. Uh, But I think that's what it is. I think it's just the brand differentiation. There's some disagreements about Syria. The other thing that's funny to me about Syria is that there isn't really policy disagreements. There's just analytic rigor disagreements, essentially. Um, Bernie Sandwiches. Oh, I, yeah. Does Jim, does Michael have an opinion on Jimmy Dore's attacks on Francesca Florentina re Syria? I'm not, I mean, I think, you know, I think indirectly I've said what needs to be said. You're calling from a 203 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hello, Michael. Hey. Yeah, this is Mark. Hello. Mark. Hi, Mark. Yeah, hi. What's going on? Can you on? hear me? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. What's on your mind? Mark, don't judge, remember? Oh. <laughs> I, listen, I got to sit. I have to sit. I have to sit something straight. Okay. Uh, Mark, you cut out. Mark, you're, you're cutting out, Mark. Mark, you're cutting out. Mark, we can't hear you at all. Can't hear you at all, Mark. Oh, can you hear me now? now yes. Can, yep. Go ahead, Mark. Mark. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, listen. Uh, the, here's the thing. There's a, been a question of uh, certain parties with a perhaps a railway motif involved in them. And uh, I just want to oh. make things very clear about these so-called train parties that you've heard about. Now, you know when a train goes into a tunnel... All right, dangerous territory, uh, Mark. We usually appreciate it, uh, but I think... I think we have to draw the line. I think we're drawing the line on that one. And it says a lot when I say we're drawing a line on certain types of jokes. You're calling from a 407 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, uh, Michael. Is this me? Yep. Yeah, so this is Gregory Regal, the Brisbane living in New Jersey. Hey, what's going on? So I usually call it the TMBS, but I was working late last night, so I didn't get to call in. Uh, you're Rodrigo oh. from New Jersey, correct? Yes. Okay, what's on your mind, man? Um, I actually wanted to comment a little bit on Hadaji and the Brazilian election. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I like that the transfer of votes is happening right now from Lula to him and he's growing in polls. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to give a little insight onto how Brazilian elections work. They're very different with the U.S. There is no such thing as the Electoral College in Brazil. They are direct vote and pretty simply majority wins. In the case that, in the case that there is no overwhelming majority in the first voting session, yep. then you go into the second one where the two candidates with the, most, with the, with the two most votes uh, duke it out again. Um, and my primary worry was that Hadaji wouldn't get enough transfer of votes in the first turn to, to beat out Bolsonaro. I was very worried that he might, Bolsonaro might just get through, even though he has a higher rejection rate than approval rating. Right. Um, it's looking a lot more optimistic now. Um, but, yeah, uh, fight the fascists. That's what I want Fight to say. the fascists. Thanks for the call, man. Yeah, brief update on that. I, I, what's happening in Brazil, and this is the part, 
I would suggest, obviously, that any international left solidarity would be, of course, for freeing Lula, for understanding the impeachment of Dilma and the judicial, the, the sort of legal coup against her in the context of the Workers' Party winning four straight Democratic presidential elections, 2003 to 2014, and lifting between 20 and 40 million people out of poverty, as I always say. And obviously, I think, you know, we played Noam Chomsky last week visiting Lula in prison. The other aspect of this, if that part interests you less, which it shouldn't, it's a major issue, and Lula is an incredibly important figure, and one that, of course, there's plenty of legitimate criticism of as any other politician, but one who is a, it's very rare to find a political colossus who's also a good actor. And, but J.R. Bolsonaro is a fascist candidate. And he's running literally on promoting and increasing security service and police murders in Brazil, of which there already are thousands in peripheral and poorer areas in a highly class stratified racist society. This is a place where Mariela Franco, who was a great city councilwoman, an open lesbian who raised herself from poverty and advocated for justice and socialism, her and her driver were assassinated several months ago in a professional hit by either a drug gang, paramilitaries, or potentially off-duty police. And there has been very little to no slow, pathetic political and judicial response to that. And the capital class in Brazil, as the sort of traditional neoliberal right collapses, they are again showing their true colors. They are moving with the fascist candidate. And now Haddad, who is Lula's sort of replacement because the Supreme Court of Brazil has blocked the capacity of Brazilian voters to exercise their democratic rights in an election and vote for Lula, who was the massive leader in the polls and would have absolutely defeated the fascist candidate. Uh, now Haddad, who's the former mayor of Sao Paulo, is running in his place, and him winning that election. Uh, certainly has global stakes. If you're concerned by Trump, if you're concerned by you know, Brexit, if you're concerned by Orban, uh, you have to be extremely concerned about Bolsonaro. Uh, Bolsonaro's son, quote, tweeting Infowars, saying that he'd be open to going on and talking about what's happening in Brazil, stories that Steve Bannon and Michelle Bachman have connections to the Bolsonaro camp, and of course, University of Chicago economists and privatizers uh 502 i believe this is connor i i you got to be real quick connor sure. actually two points but real quickly you were on the kavanaugh subject yep and i would ask you uh not to necessarily uh in retort but to, to discuss it on your show uh lindsey graham and mcconnell and grassy have all come out publicly so much on kavanaugh's side uh, how can they possibly be considered impartial when they're wanting, obviously, to go into the he said, she said? And if Grassy falls asleep during uh, the whole thing, will that matter on his vote? And then I had a, a second. Well, just let me let me le- let me leave it at that. I got I got to be quick today because there's so many in the line. We're not going to get to all of them. Thanks so much for the call, though. Uh, they're obviously not impartial. This is political warfare. And these guys don't care about these issues. In fact, they are active opponents of dealing with them. The president of the United States, the leader of the party, the guy who they spin for and protect in corruption probes and stupid tweets has a, 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 an account, uh, you know, an ac- a, a, again, an exceeding, a, a very, very credible story. I want to be careful about, you know, just, legally how these things are phrased but multiple accusations of sexual assault and one account of rape against him they voted for him he is the leader of their party they don't care they don't care i mean you know in a healthy society they could even say like this could be a time of introspection for all men (laughs) in every way shape and form not only are they not going to go there, 
they are waging political battle, which the subtext of which reaffirms that there should always be two-tier justice, that people like Kavanaugh should not be held accountable in any way, shape, or form, and that this needs to reaffirm privilege of every type, gender, class, and color, and so on. So of course not. It's political warfare. If Grassley falls asleep, um, I guess it will break the tension from what will sure to be a just a really disgusting hearing tomorrow. Yeah, but if they stopped taking votes from senators just because they fell asleep during the proceedings, there wouldn't be votes. For yeah, senators. that's also true. And I have to say, if you've ever done like a a long C-SPAN watch, you could have a sense of, uh, of why folks might fall asleep. You're calling from a 505 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey there, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, my name is Axel. I'm calling from Washington State. Hey, Axel, what's going on? So um, you know, a couple of days ago when you guys were talking about Jimmy Dore, I know you love it when people bring him up, but it just reminded me of a kind of mindset that I kind of wanted to pick your brain about. So mm -hmm. um, I err on the side of like anarcho-syndicalism and my political beliefs, mm -hmm. but I am moderate in terms of action in the sense of I don't agree with a lot of my peers that breaking shit works all the time. So um, I think electoral politics is really important. And so people like Jimmy Dore are often really popular with, um, you know, people on more my side of the spectrum of things because of that kind of aggressive apathy that he seems to implore. And so I just mm -hmm. wanted to see how do you think would be an effective way of getting people within that mindset to be more active in electoral politics and seeing the importance of it, or even if it's uh, like, or if it's a pointless cause. Well, I mean, you know better than me. That's your scene. What do Fair you enough. Think? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've tried engaging with these people, yeah. uh, my people, so to speak. Yeah. And often it just kind of comes down to the, the cyclical apathy circle. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Is voting doesn't work, so I don't vote. And then when you don't vote, the you know rabid right-wingers that are motivated by you know single issues like abortion or racism or whatever, they are, you know, their power electorally is expanded. And so... You people who don't vote see that their vote matters more in a sense. The right wingers vote matters more in a sense, and then it just motivates them to not vote even further. <laughs> right. So it's kind of hard to them to understand of like, hey, you know, if you essentially break the cycle, you know, you'll see how effective it is. And people like Ocasio Cortez um, have spurned some hope, I would say, because it really sh and like I can't remember the, the a woman's name that won uh, the the city council race, the socialist in uh, New York City, I think. Um, it, it shows that I think in, you, you mean know, in Seattle, you mean in Seattle, Kashama um, Sawant? No, 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 not Seattle. Although yes, her, but no. just recently, I can't remember her Salazar. name. Uh, oh, 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 Julia Salazar, right. For state Senate. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly right. That's right. Okay. Got it. And so, um, yeah, so the, the thing is, is it's really hard convincing these people that, you know, look, action works, but then, you know, often I come across, oh, well, you know, it's just a city council position or, uh, you know, that that's a fluke or, you know, yeah, maybe that works in that one instance, but it's more effective to, you know, essentially not participate in the system. And it's frustrating having that conversation with these people, frankly, because uh, we are all in the system, right? And, I, and any kind of movement forward is, is you know, good in my, in my mind. I, I think there's a nub that uh, always we kind of always run up against, especially with Dorr, because if he was so con uh, convinced that the Democratic Party is useless and it's never going to be able to re be reformed, which I don't think is uh, on the face of it. You know, that's not definitely wrong. It might be right. Um, but then you would focus on this sort of other ways of organizing yeah. and empowering people. But he doesn't. Yeah, like, I guess. Right. I right. mean, I guess my question is and I like I guess two parts. One is I'm very skeptical of people who treat politics as some type of countercultural activity or a social grouping. And I don't mean this in terms of like your actual politics. Your actual politics can be like what you want. Um, right. And sometimes you're going to be involved in formations and, and, you know, political stances that are smaller because, you know, by definition, they don't have as much buy in yet. So that's fine. Sure. But I still think that e like even if you're an anarcho syndicalist or whatever, the notion is that at some point you do want to acquire power. You do want to actually reach a lot of people. And I think that right. 
if your stance is wedded to a sort of cultural posture of being outside of things, no matter what, like, I think sometimes people have to ask mm. yourselves, well, because my my goal with my politics, like my friend Bashkar Sunkara, he always, I love it, he said, I, I want to have pre-mainstream politics. So I'm setting up politics today that in five years or 10 years or 20 years is going to be mainstream, right? Like there's going to be a time if we win, say just even from now we're just talking the socialist side where, I mean, obviously Medicare for all, but say mass democratizations of certain kinds of the parts of the economy like that's been one and it's absorbed into and a part of mainstream politics it's what things are that's the goal the goal is not right. five ten twenty years we're out protesting and and marginal right now Obviously, it's it's a it is a dialectic because on the other hand, when those things are achieved, then there's going to be a next wave of people who are out on the next horizon, and it's always a tension between, well, what's being smart and strategic and about power and dealing with things as they are while having clear, you know, achievable or you know, a, a clear map of goals uh, versus limiting your Im imagination and sense of possibility. So I'm not saying that these things aren't, they're complicated and p people have different positions on them that are legitimate. But if your stance is, whether it's Jimmy Dore or anarcho cynicalist, which is that essentially I can sit myself in a room or more appropriately, probably in some type of chat room and talk myself into not doing anything, you're just in cultural posture, anti-politics. And that is not yeah. only not a part of a solution and forward momentum, it's actually an agent of being of the right because that's who it benefits. Yes. Any default to the that's mean a, benefits the mean. right. Even if you occasionally break a window or call Cory Booker a fucking sellout or whatever, doesn't matter. <laughs> it's irrelevant. Right. It does nothing. That's not threatening any private equity firm. That's not redistributing exactly. any cash. It doesn't mean a fucking thing. They still thing. keep their money. They still keep their money. You can yeah. rant all you anything, want. They make even, more off of it. You can break a Starbucks window too if you want, right? Like, and maybe you get away with it, maybe you won't. It doesn't make any difference. Doesn't. Yeah, that anti politics is an excellent point. If anything, that ideology kind of lends itself to, I don't know, like people in my circle of things, I. Like, you kind of come across one of two people, you know, people more like me that understand coalition building and moving things forward. Even if it is only a trickle right now, it becomes a waterfall later. Right. It's important. And then you get other people who are reactionary is not the right word. Cause I know it's a, like a right wing term. I get that. But the mindset seems similar in that it's just about being against something. It's yeah. about being angry. It's not necessarily about, you know, building for a solution. <laughs> yeah, know. no, I think that's exactly right. I think there's a couple things like it seems like a trickle now, but compared to like maybe years ago, this seems like a flood, right? So right. it's just stuck it, when you're stuck in time and how slowly it moves. You it's and these things sort of move relatively glacially. It's hard to notice even when that glacial pace picks up. It right, yeah, exactly. And the other thing I wanted to notice is I think there's a certain type of electoral skeptic who really actually wishes the electoral way was a way that could uh, solve everything for it, and then they would vote for it. Like, Jimmy Dorse right. doesn't seem right. anti-electoral. He seems like all the people are just mistaken that they should be voting for Democrats when they should be voting for the Green Party. And he doesn't... And even, even the rhetoric of, like... I actually did talk about this last night, and it really has big implications for Latin America, but it's like... The that specific way of moralizing politics that it's not, not only is it electorally focused, it's really as simple as like, you know, they went against their conscience. They sold out. They did this. They did that. Not the like actual give and take and literal structural factors of how things actually happen, which if you dealt mm -hmm. with is actually way more frightening than individual people being bad or good or whatever, because there's a, that, I mean, when Jeremy Corbyn, say Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders become prime minister and president, right? That's great. Mm -hmm. The the serious right. work begins the next day because all of the structural conditions are still against them achieving even the most 
basic of human decency and social democracy. And that has nothing exactly. to and do with person. them being fucking sellouts or whatever. It's because capital <laughs> right. controls and they're the process. They're going to make certain compromises to get electoral wins. People don't seem to understand that. You're not going to have a perfect person. You know, like, I like Bernie Sanders. I voted for him. I volunteered for the guy. But, like, his stance on Israel isn't as strong as I wish it would be, right? right? Yeah. His stance of course. on, you know, like, these are things. That, like, he's as right as I would go, you know, ideally. But, like, I understand that, you know, you're not going to get a perfect cake every time you're baking here. Like, it's just <laughs> you're going to have to kind of take what you can get in a lot of ways. And the only way you can really get that ultimate win is by laying the groundwork, grassroots activism, making the case to actual voters and people. You're not going to get it by bitching on Twitter. And also picking the real battles. Like, again, like I, I keep saying this with AOC. There's been a few things that like, I forget what, I think Jamie brought something up yesterday where it's like, that's great. If, if a caucus from the DSA had a concern about a policy position, wrote her a letter and she met with them, that's positive. But still, like, most of the things that people are like blowing their steam on are nothing. Or how she like, performed in a media It's hit. literally like, I don't like the way she did this media hit. I didn't like what she tweeted. Wait till the woman gets to Congress and you have to figure right. out <laughs> what you need to intervene <laughs> on. All this stuff is just silly. I mean, I, it's just, it's She's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Yet. It's less than relevant. <laughs> it's it's anti-relevant. It's nonsense. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, the call, yeah, man. It's just noise. It's just noise. Thanks Thank for the call. Uh, all right, let's run through this. Uh, Donald Trump, of course, was not only laying the groundwork to saying, I know you are, but what am I? China's the real intervener. He also, and this was a report that came out a couple of weeks ago. I covered it on this show. Uh, serious exploration of backing a coup in Venezuela. Let's be really clear here. You can't sugarcoat what's happening in Venezuela. There's massive corruption. There's serious humanitarian problems. Uh, there's a, actually such a large military presence in the government that I don't know how in some ways we square this with it being a left government at this point. Although, obviously, the Bolivarian Revolution and Chavez have definitely achieved some excellent things. And I think it's also a very legitimate and very serious question to ask, what would replace it? Uh, a U.S.-backed coup is not going to deal with corruption issues. It's not going to deal with the relationship between the Venezuelan military and the cocaine trade. As I say, if anything, the cocaine trade that it's a part of might just flip from an alliance with people on the sort of the FARC remnants to right-wing paramilitaries and cartels in Colombia, which is going to happen to some extent anyways because the FARC has been demilitarizing. So any of the issues that these people are using, some of which are right and we can't spin, that are real legitimate problems of Maduro and Venezuela, are first of all part and parcel of a military that you would use to advance a coup because that's actually the seat of where things like these cartel connections come from. And number two if you have a different social base of a military coup, whatever tiny remnants of social progress that were achieved by the Bolivarian governments that are still holding on will be promptly destroyed. And number three, we should oppose U.S.-backed military coups, period, full stop. Here's the idiot at the United Nations talking and musing about just such a thing in Venezuela. Every option is a seal on the table, even... All options are on the table. Mr. Every Mr. President, Mr. President, the strong ones and the less than strong ones. Every option, and you know what I mean by strong. Every option is on the table with respect to Venezuela. Secretary We're going to take care of the people of Venezuela. We have many Venezuelans living in the United States. Many of them live in the Doral area of Miami. I've gotten to know them very well. These are great, great people. We're going to take care of those people. Mr. Just a pure replication of the right-wing Cuban dynamic there, which is another thing to look at. Uh, I think his name was Posada, but a Cuban terrorist who worked with the CIA from the Bay of Pigs through 2002 when he was arrested in Panama as part of a plot, another plot to attempt to assassinate Fidel Castro, uh, spent some of his time in Venezuela. How many of those were there total, by the way? 
I mean, I think at least dozens as have yeah. like I think like we know of dozens that have been declassified. Like declassified, dozens of attempts to assassinate Fidel. Castro. Dosing his uh, radio studio with uh, 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 air LSD, uh, aerosol LSD, I believe was one of them. Should we do an illicit history on that? That might be fun. Just actually, like a yeah. pure chronicle of like bizarre plots to assassinate Castro. There was also the exploding cigar one was real. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and for those curious how Trump might know a bunch of people from an exurb outside Miami to be Venezuelan, uh, he has a golf course there. Great course. Doral. Doral. Great course. Great, great course. A lot of good Venezuelans around it. <laughs> it's funny how he was talking about defending the Venezuelan people and immediately just uh, pivoted to them being people in Florida. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm These Venezuelans this. in Florida. <laughs> Look, who's not an electoral skeptic? This guy. <laughs> you can welcome immigrants in highly specific circumstances. You know, we always talk about how Republicans get a conscience when it implicates a family member. So all of a sudden they go from being uh, virulently opposed to marriage equality and rights for gay and lesbian people if they have a daughter or a son who turns out to be gay or lesbian. Or maybe they, uh, you know, if they're Conrad Black, there's a pull, some uh, media oligarch from Canada who spent time in jail and all of a sudden uh, had at least a few thoughts when he first get out, got out about the problems with uh, uh, policing. Sam? Can you f leave that Apple box, please? The small one. You have it in your right hand. Yeah, I need that. Thanks. <laughs> Schmuck. Uh, did he just throw that away? Yeah, I do need to reset. I need to. I need to. I need to. Uh, I need to mail the broken one back to the insurance company. Jesus. Um, so you know how we talk about how Republicans have a conscience. Uh, all of a sudden when it affects either them personally or a member of their family. So if they have discriminated against the campaign against gay and lesbian people their whole career, they might all of a sudden support marriage equality if one of their kids turns out to be gay or lesbian. Or if they're Conrad Black, uh, they might say, hey, I went to jail and actually I realized that the system's a little harsh on people because I literally had a personal experience of it. So that's the Republican track record. And the joke has always been, you just need Republicans to go out and experience all forms of political, economic, sexual, and racial oppression, and then they might all of a sudden have a conscience. Well, as so many comforting thoughts like that about Republicans, this is just getting totally debunked in 2018. Josh Hawley is the Republican candidate running against Claire McCaskill for Senate in Missouri, and... Um, he is going to deploy an incredibly novel reason for wanting to get rid of the ACA and get rid of protecting people with pre-existing conditions. And we are clearly turning a new leaf here in Republican politics. We've got two perfect little boys. Just ask their mama. Earlier this year, we learned our oldest has a rare chronic disease. Pre-existing condition. We know what that's like. I'm Josh Hawley. I support forcing insurance companies to cover all pre-existing conditions. And Claire McCaskill knows it. You deserve a senator who's driven to fix this mess, not one just trying to hang on to her office. And that's why I approve this message. I'm trying to get rid of the legislation that protects the little prick. And uh, we've got a magic one in the works. I mean, as far as I understand, he's on record of supporting the Graham-Cassidy repeal. Which uh, would er, this is from Splinter News. Yes. Earlier this year, Holly's office became one of the night one of nineteen state attorneys general to join Texas Attorney uh, General Ken Paxton <laughs> in suing the federal government <laughs> over Obamacare. Maybe my kid isn't that perfect after all. Maybe you shouldn't <laughs> have joined that suit if you love your kids yeah, so much, yeah. Joshua. Yeah, I don't know. Josh doesn't seem like you love your kid. But they're going for it, right? That he's just going to try to lie about this, and and yeah. this whole pre-existing condition. This is just thing? the this is just the shift from let's let's just let's like, as I say, it's like the Bush administration lied about WMDs in Iraq consistently, thoroughly, and fully. Trump would just say we found them. They're there. Watch InfoWars. 
Yeah, and this is a... It, the main important thing about this is how much it shows how afraid Republicans are of the health care stuff. Right. Because Kevin Kramer's been doing this with the High Camp race, too. There's like, f- there's like fuzziness over what High Camp said the, the repeal would do about pre existing conditions, but they're hiding behind that fuzziness because they ultimately know that it's true that these Republicans are suing to, uh, to kibosh those um, pre existing condition uh, you know, protections. And, that's, and Jeff and Sessions isn't defending it. Right. I mean, it, it yeah. is a next level to put your kid's life on the line in order to... It's not his kid's a- life on the line. He's going to have coverage for his kid. It's, it's the opposite. It's like if Jimmy Kimmel went out the- on, on Late Night and said, I have my own experience with this, and that's a really important issue to me, and I care about it deeply, which is why I support the Graham Cassidy bill. Because it would get rid of the problems with the ACA What's and invigorate our markets, but also protect people like my son. No, this guy's fine. He's just a complete sociopath, and he's a debunker of the, if it happens to my kids, I get a conscience theory of Republican policymaking. To use your children in this kind of ad where you're ignoring the fact that one of your main public acts in, in office is to sign on to a, an anti-pre-existing uh, condition coverage lawsuit is... Uh, that is le- that's next level sociopathy. That is next level sociopathy. I like I like what you bring in Josh. Uh, Josh, he's bringing a lot. You know, he looks like a nice clean cut Midwest guy, not much going on, maybe a little bit of an airhead, but when I saw him put his kid, I mean, that'd be like me putting a vodka in an incest awareness ad. He's like a prospect. That was super impressive. Yeah, sign that kid. <laughs> sign him up. Bring him to the majors. Dr. Chaos MD became a patron of MR and TMBS last night. Keep up the good work. Also tell Matt and Jamie not to worry as my budget for supporting media expands. They're on the short list for my patronage. Left is best. Oh, good. Theodore Cuxtable takes a con to know a con. Uh, Max in Phoenix. How would Trump know that there's a group of people getting together plotting cons and laughing about it? Is that insider knowledge? Might be projection. I think Schumer drunk dials him. He's just like, hey, you idiot. We're here laughing about Kavanaugh. Ha, ha, ha. Chappie, Cosby should have followed his own advice. Yeah, that's not a great joke. I'm sorry. Um, if Kavanaugh really wanted the, Fo- the Fox News to go well, he should have done some shots, man. <laughs> Down a few brewskis and had some of his bros with him. They would have showed up and stuck and showed. Uh, they would have showed up, showed that a stuck up prude had to ask a Georgetown prep man a question, if you know what I mean. Ted Kennedy was not hamstrung because of Chappaquitta. He was silenced while partying with. He was silenced because while partying with his nephew, nephew, he drunkenly ran ran around in only his shorts and t-shirt while his nephew assaulted a girl. In a way that would have made Kavanaugh proud. Jesus, Never all right. I thought it was fucking Chappaqua. I didn't even know that story. Chappaquitta, excuse me. Uh, uh, and the other story happened in Florida. Jesus. Gasse. Uh, why, wasn't there a law passed to help protect us from foreign manipulation of our elections, but no funds have been spent so far? If China succeeds, it's his fault, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> Definitely not with his bla- base. Uh, and just saying, we replaced John Conyers with Rashida Talib holding abusers' accounts. Good for the left. Uh, yes. That yeah, worked out. Perfectly. Um, Pajama Boy. Andrew Gillum tweeted his support for sanctions against the wife of Maduro. I found that troubling. Yeah. I mean, he's going to say, look, Andrew Gillum's going to say troubling things about Israel, Venezuela, and Cuba. And buckle in for that. <laughs> I mean. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It doesn't even make any sense. Great. You're calling from a 979 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Here we go. Hello. Hello, Michael. Yes. New York City. Yep. This is uh, Fred Foxworthy and Frank Catalina, and we're down here in Bryan, Texas, uh, where Texas A&M is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just want to say off the top, I appreciate your southern accent. And uh, and I don't think any Southerners were offended by it because you did a pretty good job. 
Okay. Well, I appreciate that. You got anything else on your mind? I do. Uh, reason being I'm calling is because Texas Senator Charles Schwertner has been accused of sexual misconduct. Our representative, he uh, apparently used his senatorial office as a means to uh, send explicit images to UT graduate students. And it's hitting the news, but we thought maybe y'all might want to know about it, too. He's a state he's senator? This, he's a state senator right now. I don't but, understand. No, well, a, how did I don't understand. How does he use his office to send images to UT grad students? You mean well, like his okay, office he's email? UT, he's a UT alumni. Okay. And so, and he's he's been a doctor, uh, chiropractor, or surgeon, or something. You know, it's, it's still, it's kind of confusing because uh, it's a developing story. But apparently, a young lady said she contacted him from LinkedIn uh, and trying to get a position. Mm-hmm. You know, with the legislature, she's mm-hmm. looking for a job, like mm-hmm. a young, good graduate student ought to do. And this guy. I don't want to call him a name. I went to his office today, and, you know, he's got his door locked. He's not taking questions, but I went up there to tell him that I'm embarrassed. But to, wait, wait, you know, wait, before he, he, but what did he do? She contacted him over LinkedIn, and he did what? He sent her, he sent her a message saying, I just really want to F you with the picture of his genital. <laughs> he pulled an Anthony Weiner oh, on I see. her. I'm not even playing, man. I see. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. He's, no, this guy, he, he, he is, he's, he, it's embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Bryan College Station and Texas A&M is a better community than this. You know, this guy, he's a, he's, he's a weirdo. But yeah. uh, what I really wanted to ask you about, too, if I can, mm-hmm. I remember you saying you were writing a book about the intellectual dark web. Yes. Well, something that I've noticed, because a friend of mine sent me a Jordan Peterson video, and I told him thank you, but this guy is ridiculous. But something that I noticed, that he's got a lot in common with this Alexander Dugan, Russian propagandist. And I don't know if you guys are looking into that angle, but... Some creepy stuff, you know. I've read about Alexander. Idea. I've read about Alexander Dugan. I'll I'll look into that a little bit more. I, I that's Man, interesting. They, a lot of their messaging is very very similar. I'll check it out. Thanks for the call, man. That Alexander Dugan is a. That, there was a lot of stories going. On. I talked with Hannah Gaze about him. Uh, you're calling from a 509 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? 509. Are you there? 509. 509. Ah, guess you're not. Try back. Uh, you're calling from an 818 area code. You're calling back. I think we lost you. Hey, this is Steve again. I'll be quick since I was on earlier. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah. What? Finish your thought. Uh, so, so real quick, so if I guess you guys said it in better terms. If, if What I was trying to say earlier is if you are skeptical about the difference that electoral politics can make in making a difference or being quote-unquote revolutionary, then you can start by trying to make a change at the workplace. Um, so if you're in a small business uh, uh, working with your coworkers to, to organize or working with your if, – if they're open to it, management to cooperative business, if you're in a large business working with – the union more actively and playing a more active role in the union and organizing to create grassroots um, work organi- labor organization in a large business. Um, and I think you'll feel more uh, of an impact and you'll actually have more potential to make a direct change uh, on things that affect you on everyday life. Like, mm-hmm. I may not be able to see the direct impact of my vote for president, honestly. I mean, I'm a middle aged white male who has a job and you know, I may not see that impact directly on me if I vote for president or, or however, but I may be able to make more of a difference on my life and help the people around me and in my workplace if I spend more time organizing in the workplace and supporting organizations that do that as well. Definitely. Um, so I hope that was clear. And no, I, that is I clear. Think they're so intertwined. Yeah. 
No, I, that's a really good point. That's I think that's very clear. Thanks for the All call. All right, thank you. I think between you and um, Chris from Taiwan, there's a lot of good marching orders. Uh, try again. You're calling from a 509 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, Michael. Hey. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Ronald Reagan. Um, yeah, it's Ronald Reagan. Um, I was thinking about maybe just transitioning my Don Jr. impression to a Kavanaugh impression. <laughs> it's the same impression, but um, <laughs> right. Hey, I wanted to help. I wanted to help you with your Trump impression a okay. little bit. Yeah, you're the master, of course. But it's just a it's a not it's a, a Trump. nuance. My Trump is not amazing. It's workable, but it's not amazing. Go ahead. Basic, basically, like he's too relaxed. You need to take a deep breath with your nose, like right in the microphone, <laughs> after every sentence, or run up and down the stairs a few times. He's uh, clearly dying of some sort of <laughs> heart disease. <laughs> but, like, uh, like my, yeah, it's kind of amazing if you think of like you just guys. need to really pronounce like <laughs> <laughs> after you know every. Every comma or after every sentence, just hit it with a deep inhale. I thought what they did and was I think pathetic. That'll really, um, I thought that was totally unfair. Yeah. And it's a cunt. <sighs> Anyways. Um, Feels yeah. terrible. Love Jesus. You. Love you back. Thanks for the call, man. All right. Uh, uh, JB Butte State. A libertarian club at my college was advertising by means of a six-foot uh, blow-up free speech beach ball. I couldn't help but go over and make some counterpoints against the libertarians, to which their only rebuttal was to ask if I liked Dave Rubin. Yeah. Needl <laughs> Needless to say, I headed to my American government class laughing. Really cool. Love your point about Kavanaugh's lack of... Of rage. If someone accused you of crimes or behavior you're sure was patently untrue, wouldn't you go nuts? I go ballistic, especially in circumstances affecting my career, relationship, reputation, and affect my actual future. My guess, yes, my guess is Avenatti, as he winds up at the primetime slot at MSNBC, he's a media player and an aggressor. We need Bernie, if not him, a protege or someone authentically aligned with a broader movement for genuine left politics. I'm Bernie's my pick. Absolutely. I don't know if we need Bernie to win. I think you read on Av an Avenatti. I mean, yeah, it seems. I'm surprised he doesn't. It's almost insulting that MSNBC has not already given him a show. Guys on there. I barely even watch cable news, and I register that Avenatti's on cable news all the time. Um, Johnny Ganja Cookie. I have qualms about an Avenatti. I know we can. I, I qualms about Avenatti. I know we complain about lack of aggression on the left, but every time someone with his style comes along, skeletons start flying out of their closet and they flame out quickly. Think Alan Grayson and Anthony Weiner. Well, I mean, it's not the biggest sample size. Ever. Yeah, I mean, but I understand the uh, suspicion. Communist dog message for the Doug, the constitutionalist. Doug, comrade Doug, you're going to let Diane Feinstein get away with what she did to Brett Kavanaugh. Vote for Kevin DeLeon. Brad Hominem. Why are we still discussing rich, centrist celebrities with no experience to be president? Uh, because one, I mean, I don't know, because they're rich. Because <laughs> they get media coverage, because people cover them. White collar crime guy. Michael, have you heard Slate's new podcast series, Slow Burn? They're covering the Clinton impeachment. I was skeptical at first because it's fucking Slate, but episode, I was all about how terrible they were to Monica Lewinsky, which is good. Would love your take on it. I've heard good things. I've I, heard good things. Yeah. Still got to listen. Apparently, Trump staffers are listening to it to figure out how they're going to react to the <laughs> Mueller investigation. That is awesome. Listen to the first season of Slow Burn. Yeah. Like, oh, this is what Nixon did, this so we can. This is what Clinton did. This it, is how we'll figure out like, the fact a, that we're literally working for like a member of the five families. Instead of dumb else. Watergate, it's plagiarized Watergate now. <laughs> That's awesome. What we used to call it, Dum Dum Watergate. You're calling from a 909 area code. Who are you? Where you're calling from? Oh, hey, Sam. Yep. Awesome. Well, uh, one, I want to say this is definitely the uh, perfect platform. I, I I think you guys have really polished it all off really well. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just a. Uh, Who are you? Where are you calling from? But, uh, Who are you? I, where are you calling from? So I'm Nick calling from uh, calling from Salt Lake City, Utah. Cool. What's on your mind, Nick? Well, I heard the uh, one of the first callers today talking about some uh, sorry anecdotal evidence about uh, 
kind of the mindset of some of the people that they're going around door to door to and kind of want to contribute my uh, kind of opinion on that, uh, expand on that a little bit. The evidence I have anecdotally is that I uh, went from a certain line of uh, menswear. So yeah, most of my customer base is pretty much all like middle management, kind of upper middle class, mm-hmm. I'm looking spun, like 900 bucks on a suit. And the one topic that seems that they have like no sway on, they'll never kind of leave that integrated base that they're kind of locked in is just cultural stuff. Like, like, the, like mostly it's still the Kaepernick stuff. Honestly, I hear every wow. single day and they flip every day on like, you know, Medi- Medicare kind of type stuff. It's, they kind of have like a moral conscience that can be reached on certain things, but that cultural based one just kind of always reels those other things back in. As soon as they start getting progressive, as soon as they start opening their eyes a little bit more, it's always, always back to that same exact point. Right. That makes total sense. It doesn't surprise me. And I think that that's the part. Look, maybe if some of these guys, they make a trade off at the ballot box and they happen to be in a moment of conscience, then that's great and they can vote the right way. But there's a lot of people who are purely locked into those things, and they're not persuadable. It's emotional tribal identity. Thanks for the call, man. Uh, all right, the final call of the day, and then we'll race through IMs. You're calling from a 616 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Michael. Yes. Hey, it's Kyle from Grand Rapids. Kyle from Grand Rapids. How you doing? What's on your mind? Doing great. Um, really quickly, I did want to clarify one point that an earlier caller had raised mm-hmm. concerning the uh, Michigan governor's primary. Mm-hmm. And they suggested that uh, the votes of El Saeed and that other phony guy combined could have exceeded Whitmer's tally. Mm-hmm. And actually, I can't confirm that's not the case. She did win with uh, 52%. So it was oh, okay. okay, got it. So I just want to clarify that. Okay. A small fact. Yep. Um, other thing kind of been recent on this week. It's almost too stupid to talk about, but it ties into um, kind of a larger but still pretty succinct point. So I wonder if I could just take a minute to explain that. Sure. Sorry, I wrote some things down. Let me get my paper ready. Okay, so this week uh, the Daily Stormer was involved in organizing kind of an astroturf campaign against some online communities organized around a computer game series. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get into the details of this because it's even dumber than when this has happened in the past, but Mm -hmm. this is a pattern of behavior, so I mostly just want to identify the pattern, Mm -hmm. which is that a lot of these right-wing organizations, they target online communities because they use certain uh, certain communities as recruiting grounds. Gaming in particular... I don't know why. I assume it's because it's dominated by a lot of white guys, and that's kind of the bread and butter for the right-wing population. But really, uh, the only advice I would give for people that may participate in some of these communities online is that it's not worth it to engage them in whatever disingenuous argument that the trolls want to pull you into. It's really just better to identify them as trolls, call out their agenda, Mm -hmm. and tell them to fuck off. And then you and your friends can get back to posting date memes about whatever the subject of your fandom is. I love it. I think that that's mostly 100% true, and I appreciate the call. The resource of yours to look out for when you're engaging with trolls is your time, because that's what they're going after. That's what they're going after. That was the final call of the day. Oh, can you guys look this up? Spocko, Michael, breaking story. Jeff Merkley's just filed a suit against Trump and McConnell to stop the com- the confirmation process because it defies the advice and consent obligation. I don't understand that. Uh, Merkley se- to seek injunction to stop Kavanaugh vote. Uh, Senator Jeff Merkley on Wednesday will announce that he's seeking an injunction in federal court designed to stop a final vote on Brett Kavanaugh, asserting an obstruction to his constitutional duty to advise and consent nominees. Hmm. And it's a wrench in the works, right? Yeah, I'm all for that. Merkley's a good tactical senator. Uh, yeah, and also one with a really legit good record. Yes. I mean, I think he is the obvious preference people for uh, to be Senate Majority Leader. And actually, I was saying that the only senator I really like is Bernie Sanders. 
And obviously, I like Elizabeth Warren in some ways, and I would put probably, you know, Jeff Merkley right there in that sort of second spot. Mo Phelan, Michael, did you catch Nas and Colbert last night? I agree, he is the best. I did not. Um, Matt Mungin, Jimmy Dore has read a book, has read one book, and makes three points over and over and over again. Let's see. Let's see, with the final I am of the day, SBG. Right. <laughs> A high camp ad shows Kramer saying he doesn't want people abusing the healthcare system because they have pre existing conditions. In other words, once you're sick, you are abusing the system. That is a I, I that's vaguely incredible remember that that was a ad ad to run on. Yeah, don't abuse it. Jesus Christ. And then after the stuff he said about Kavanaugh and he's neck and neck. He also, if you remember, was the Hillary's the, the, or the pantsuits. Remember the women who wore white to uh, Trump's, uh, was it uh, his first speech? I forget what it's called, but <clears throat> State of the Union, I State think State of the was. Union. And mm -hmm. they wore white and he's like saying they're like mentally ill because they wore white pantsuit to it. To <laughs> Yeah, Heidi Kramer is going to need to win that race, or I'm just going to trash your... Heidi Heitkamp needs to win that, or we just need to relentlessly trash your home state. Um, tomorrow, as of now, unless anything changes, we start here at around 9.50 tomorrow with live coverage of the hearings. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know Somehow I'm going to get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bulb But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are going to kick in And my pilot light Where the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid For the road that bends Before it finally breaks you I guess somehow I lost my drive Between the 101